Oh, is it time? <laughs> well, good morning, church. Good morning. Good to see you. Everybody looks chipper. We got some coffee drinkers here. Anybody else? Yeah, I know. I just had some coffee too. So I'm, 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 I'm a little excited now. So we're going to have to sing loud and we're going to sing really fast. So, but if you would go ahead and stand, we're going to, we're going to worship God this morning. That's what we do here at CAC. And what I mean by worshiping God is we're going to sing songs about God, how great he is and his grace, that he's with us. And we're also going to sing to him. So uh, make sure you feel comfortable in your own skin. There's, don't worry about other people around you. This is between you and God. This is the time to lift him up this morning. Amen? Amen. Let's put our hands together on this one. 
give glory to God. Blessed be your name, the land that is plentiful, where dreams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. truthful statement that we just sang about blessed be your name i love that song one of my favorite songs reason why i love it so much is it really has a great message regardless of the circumstance regardless of what you and i face god is always good amen no matter what we can always look to him and he will get us through and we can proclaim to him god blessed be your name so i love that song it's a good reminder for us today and what a joy so grateful that you're here with us I want to welcome you, especially if today's your first day. Just want you to know we're so glad you're here and appreciate you uh, worshiping with us today. And uh, God's got great things in store for us, so we're just really, really glad that you're here. If you wouldn't mind, take out your bullets, and I want to highlight just a couple things for you briefly here today. Uh, you have a gray sheet that says Phoenix Serve. Uh, this is uh, Joe and Janet uh, lead a group that goes down into inner city Phoenix, uh, helping out with those who are homeless and and just less fortunate in ways that uh, we can go and love on them, be uh, just Jesus to them through the hugs, the smiles, the prayers, 
the encouragement. Uh, we also like to provide, you know, the, you know, like little sanitation type bags or, you know, hygiene bags, if you will, that, that will help them. Uh, this is uh, some needs that they have. Always want to keep it in front of you. Uh, we got blessed. Uh, Habitat for Humanity here in town gave us some boxes from Home Depot that were collected. I mean, lots of boxes in these things. They had bags of of these kind of hygiene bags, and they're missing a few things from what we normally give. So that's what's on the bottom of this list. If you're out and about, you see stuff, or or you're like, hey, I could yeah, I can pick up a few extra things. Just let us know. We'd love for you to to be able to do that, get it, to bring it here when you do. We'll make sure it gets it to them. And then when they get ready to prepare to go for their next time uh, and, and go down to the city, they'll take it with them. So, again, just want to encourage you with that. Uh, inside your bulletin, you also have a yellow sheet that uh, uh, is your sermon notes. And, again, want to keep that in front of you. Uh, this is, uh, we're going through Timeline. That's our series that we're in. And today, uh, today it, uh, we're talking specifically about how sin trusts in self. Sin trusts in self. We're going to look at how it all began, how it all goes back to the garden, and how that plays out in our own lives when we look and allow those areas of temptation, what have you, to feed into us, and if we allow any kind of opportunity. And it, it, it's really, we're saying, God, we're not going to trust you in this moment, in this situation. We're going to trust ourselves in our own thinking. So keep that close to you. We'll be working our way through that as well. Um, <clears throat> we also, I just want to uh, draw your attention here uh, on the inside of the bulletin, uh, if you look at this, we've kind of been retooling some things, so I just want to keep your attention here. Uh, inside here is where we have all of our, our, our life study series. What this is, is our discipling mechanism of our church, the way that we get God's Word into you in various formats. There are all kinds of opportunities for you to be involved, to plug in, uh, to be a part of, to grow in your relationship with God, which again, part of our vision and mission here is to know Christ. We, wanna, we don't want to just have head knowledge. We want to have heart knowledge. We want to we wanna grow in the depth of who He is and who, he, who, who we are in Him and what He's done for us. Well, these are the opportunities that we provide for that. It starts Sunday, goes all the way through the end of the week. Uh, if you look at the very, very bottom, this is going to be a key piece uh, where it says looking ahead. This is information looking forward in the week or two in front of us. So please pay attention to that so that way you can keep informed with uh, the things that are going on here. Uh, speaking of which, if you look down and looking ahead, uh, again, I want to keep this in front of you. On Easter Sunday, we're two Sundays out. Next week is Palm Sunday. The week after that is Easter Sunday. Here at Community Alliance, one of the things we normally do, we have an 8 o'clock service and a 10 o'clock service. On that day and that day only, we're only going to have one service, and that service will be at 9 a.m. It'll be in the paper. It's gonna, we're going to take up a big ad in the paper, I just want to keep it in front of you. Make sure you're thinking about it, coming. We want to invite people. We have such a blast on Easter. It's a great time. We follow it with a little bit of a brunch afterwards. And I uh, want to encourage you to, uh, you know, to be part of that. In fact, the other sheet that you have in your bulletin that's yellow talks about that. Uh, we need some help with, with uh, you know, just some of those brunch items. If you want to be part of that, put your name and the quantity and put your cell phone down or a number to get a hold of you. And uh, put that in the, in the offering plate as it goes by later. Uh, but we, we look forward to it. It's a great time. But, okay, so real quick, what time are we meeting on Sunday? On Easter, it's going to be at 9 a.m. Okay, inevitably, somebody's going to show up at 10, and I'm going to say, hey, great, come join us for brunch. We're going to be done. So, and it's okay, but 9 a.m., please pass the word as much as you can, and uh, we're going to have a good time together. So it'll be a lot of fun, okay? All right, so those are the announcements that I have for you. Uh, we do have one last thing real quick. Uh, right here, this uh, information sheet. This was, for those of you who haven't filled it out, they're on the uh, ledge out here on, on your way out of uh, the sanctuary here this morning. Uh, just encourage you to fill this out to help us keep everything up to date, and uh, that would be most appreciated, okay? All right, let's go ahead and pray. Let's ask God's blessing today. Father, you're good and wonderful. We give you praise and glory. God, how wonderful it is to serve our risen Savior. God, thank you for the love you have for us. Thank you for all that you've done. I pray, Father, that today that you would just be honored and glorified in every single way. God, we, we love you and we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we meet and greet here, I forgot one last thing. Uh, <laughs> out of my mind, sorry. Thursday morning, 9 a.m., anybody who likes to paint, okay, let me qualify that, likes to paint, we're painting the foyer area and we could use some help if anybody wants to come and join us. It'll be 9 a.m., so if I see you, great, come uh, to have a good time. We'll have, uh, we're just going to knock out that foyer and get it all done in time for Easter, okay? All right, please stand, greet each other today in the name of the Lord.
All right, as we turn back to our seats, we'll get prepared for morning offering and giving. Go ahead and have you take a seat, if you would, please. I'm going to ask Cindy Henson if you come on down here. Cindy Henson, come on down. Very excited for this moment. This is Cindy. Can we all say hi, Cindy? Hi, hi Cindy. Cindy. Okay. All right. Cindy wants to share something. She was part of the L.A. team who went to Watts and uh, did an awesome thing. When she was up here and she shared, she felt like she got choked up. <laughs> and she really said, darn it, I didn't get to share really what I wanted to share. So she wants to give a testimony about what God did in that trip. So, Cindy, would you please share away, okay? Thank you. First of all, thank you very much for allowing me to do this the second time. Um, it was something that really changed uh, my life, actually. Uh, at first, I didn't want to go. I, I, excuse me, I apologize for getting choked up now, but it, it's, I'm not used to talking in front of a lot of people, but it was something I, I've always wanted to do with missions. Um, going to Mexico or the Philippines just wasn't there for me and when I learned that there was one right here in the United States and LA being so close I thought okay I can do this but then fear and uh, I went and talked to Pastor Monty and he said don't let the fear get in there and went home prayed about it and God really laid on my heart saying that this is something that I needed to do and, and really wanted to do and uh, again it was something that I'm so grateful for uh, went with a group of people. There was six of us that went, uh, seven including Pastor. And what I got on that, I, I got to know people that, you know, you see them here in church, but I got to know them more on a personable level. And that was awesome and amazing in itself. You know, it kind of changes when you go in a small little group. But spent the night on a Saturday night in a little town right before we got into L.A. and just enjoyed some real fellowship and dinner that night and got to know each other better. Sunday went into the L.A. Envision uh, Church and, you know, you walk in and me being shy like I am wasn't real big on going around and meeting other people. We said hi, and but I kind of stuck back with my church people from Wickenburg because that was my, where my comfort zone was. Later, uh, that after church, actually, we had devotions, and Pastor Todd had uh, seen how we all sat around in a circle, so all of the Wickenburg church group sat in one spot, and then all of them sat in another spot, and Pastor said, you know, Pastor Todd says, I'm going to change this up a little bit. So he kind of joined us with one of his group. And I was very fortunate enough to sit next to a girl named Shay. And Pastor Todd, Pastor Todd had given us like seven questions to ask each other. What's your favorite food? You know, what do you like doing? Who's your favorite football team? And I'm telling you, by the time we were done, we were all laughing and got to know each one of them a little bit better as well. And Shay and I really had a connection after that and we're just laughing it was just a lot of fun and i think that kind of broke the ice going into that night the next day was um let me back up a little bit so everybody had to kind of give their own little testimony in that day on sunday night there was a guy named chris he his testimony was he grew up without a father in his life 
turned into a gang. And uh, one night, you know, the gang had rivalries down out on the street, and one of his best friends got shot. And he sat there and watched it. He couldn't go in to help his friend because then he himself would have gotten killed. So he had to sit there and watch his best friend die on the streets of L.A. in a gang fight. I couldn't even imagine. He ended up a little while later, got busted for drugs, went and spent time in prison. And while he was in prison, he said, you know, I grew up without a father. He had two kids. He said, I do not want my kids to grow up without a father. He then accepted the Lord as his savior in prison and got out and has made a tremendous job to change his life. And he lives right there on the Envision campus himself. And uh, he was probably one of the hardest working workers there. He stepped right in to help us clean up the place. Anything that we needed, he was right there. He came to any one of us to, to offer help. Um, so then we went down on Monday afternoon and went and did the, uh, as you guys know, Skid Row. And that also, before I left, I prayed for really a change in my heart. I have a good heart, but sometimes I can be judgmental and not understand, I think is a lot of it. We got down there and it was great. We were handing out peanut butter jelly sandwiches, you know, hygiene bags, food. And I happened to look over and there was this guy, I believe his name was Jose, that was sitting there. And I had walked over there and our conversation between us 20 times was he was wanting to know what he could do for me. And I said, no, what can I do for you? And I honestly, the flesh came out. I was, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do next. And I called uh, jo Joseph over to pray over him, and he did. And I still found myself there not knowing what to do, what to say. And my mom came over, and she took it over, and I kind of backed away. I thought, okay, I'm going to go over here to where I'm comfortable with. And uh, my mom handled it with such grace. I mean, she just really stepped in there and, and uh, took over. And every time I looked over there, you know, she's still over there talking to him. I'm thinking, okay, what is she talking to him about? Because all I could get out of him was what can he do for us? Before I know it, she's calling pastor over there to, you know, interact with him. And before I know it, pastor's calling this guy's dad. And I'm telling you, I walked away from that thinking, you know, this guy's father could have been the only connection that he had before he passed or something happened to his kid. And that was very touching to me to know that, you know, I kind of beat myself up a little bit, but in the same way, that's how God used me. And I know that that's changed my life. It changed my life going into the rest of my time there. And it's changed my life for my next hopefully missions trips that I'm going on and I encourage anybody and everybody out there that is kind of hesitant or they just don't know really pray about it because it is a life changer um, <clears throat> excuse me okay pastor's wife's name is Jen and she was just an amazing woman in herself and she had also mentioned that um, in the 12 years they've been there, my mom, who is 80 years old, was the oldest missionary team member to be there to help. So that was a big thing for them over the 12 years. And we might not have, um, I know Pastor didn't want to bring Wickenburg Community Alliance there, but we definitely brought Wickenburg there to where I know they know when they, they hear Wickenburg, they're going to think of this little group that came to help them out in the 12, year, 12 years that they've been there. Just a little, little bit that we did for them changed for them as well as for us. And I really thank Pastor Monty for, for getting that uh, charged up. And I thank, for, thank you to all the other people that went with me and made this trip possible. It was great to get to know each and every one of you. And thank you for letting me get up here and talk, talk about this again. Hey, you hold on real quick. You hold on one second. Cindy, this, what, what you don't realize, guys, this is, this is a work of God's transformation in Cindy. She would not have done this if I begged, pleaded, paid, or whatever a year and a half ago.
So this is a testimony of what God can do. And thank you so much. And can we give God praise for that? Hallelujah. Thank you so very, very much. Let's go ahead and have the men come forward. We'll prepare for the morning giving. Uh, just as a prayer a list, uh, pray for us next Sunday after church. Uh, there's a small group of us who are going to back to Watts. We're going back to the Envision site. We're going to be putting up our old projection unit and screen. We're giving that to them so that they can show uh, the Jesus film. They want to show the passion of the Christ on Easter Sunday to their congregation. So we're looking forward to that. So pray for us if you would on that. Let's pray. Father, we love you and thank you. Just are grateful, God, for all that you do, all that you provide. God, thank you for the transformation in Cindy and God, how you continue to work in each and every one of us. God, we give you praise for that. We ask, Lord, that today as we give back to you that which you've given us, we, we trust you because, God, you are the one who provides, and we're grateful for that. God, we acknowledge that all good gifts come from our Heavenly Father above. Thank you for your provision. God, thank you that you tell us that you love it when we give cheerfully. So, God, may we do so with the right heart today, and may the advancement of your kingdom God, happen in every way. We give you the praise and the glory. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.
down on that cross what a sight to see he shook the earth with just his light's breath now the demons believe let me tell you about a savior more than a story to me Let me tell you about my Jesus He's more than a mystery He took my sins and my sorrows Walked the grave and set me free
a story to me.
you as our king and Jesus is our Lord of Lords as our maker as our creator both heaven and earth we come under you in obedience and we lift you up today we pray Lord Father that you would teach us Lord open up the word and just teach us from your mighty spirit today that all the distractions, all the things that may lie within us, Lord, do not matter right now. What only matters is between what you have to say to us and what we have to learn and act out. We thank you, Lord, for your son and all this, Lord Father, we give him the glory. And it's in his name, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. Thank you, worship team. I thought I'd begin today by asking you a question. Have you ever had an argument with yourself? Anybody here? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not talking like a schizophrenic kind of way. I'm just saying those arguments that take place when you're in that moment of decision. And specifically, in the moment of decision between do I follow the flesh, do I follow the spirit? Do I follow the flesh? Do I follow the spirit? And in those moments, in your thoughts, in your thinking, you kind of argue with yourself back and forth. We're even given the possibility of contemplation. Of course, the flesh is what? That's those things we find temptation and kind of draw us away and entice us and what have you. And, of course, the spirit of God and following him is, is more of about obedience to God and his word, the things that you know, the things that you know to be true. Anybody ever struggle with that? Am I the only honest one in the room today? God, that's awesome. Yeah, guys, seriously, we, we, we all do. We all do on some level. And I know, I know you've had those moments. I have. I mean, especially depending on the temptation versus obedience. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, it's going to be and will be ultimately in that battle will be how much arguing with yourself that you do. And I thought, I have a little clip I want to show you. Maybe, maybe you can relate. <laughs> Mission accomplished. You're not just gonna let him die like that, are you? My shoulder angel. Don't listen to that guy. He's trying to lead you down the path of righteousness. I'm gonna lead you down the path that rocks. I'll come off it. You come off it. You. 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 You infinity. Ah. Listen up, big guy. I got three good reasons why you should just walk away. Number one, look at that guy. He's got that sissy stringy music thing. We've been through this. It's a harp, and you know it. All right. That's a harp, and that's a dress. Rub. Reason number two, look what I can do. <laughs> what? What does that have to do with me? No, no. He's got a point. Listen, you guys. You're sort of confusing me, so, uh, be gone. Uh, or, uh, you know, however I get rid of you guys. That'll work. Okay, I don't know if you watch cartoons. Anybody here a cartoon watcher? I find that very funny. It makes a point. It does. I'm not sure if we have a shoulder angel. I don't know. I don't know at all. But I will tell you this, and it probably you can agree with me, is the fact that the struggle that we go through in those moments, it can be pretty intense, right? 
can be pretty intense, pretty strong, depending on what kind of thing that we're playing to. Uh, grab your uh, fill in the blank here. We're going to give you your first one today. What many of us forget, that's your first fill in the blank, what many of us forget or don't consciously think about is that we are all of us, that is all mankind is in a cosmic battle. Again, let me give it to you. What many of us forget or don't consciously think about is that we, mankind, are in a cosmic battle. Folks, we got to pay attention to this because it's not just about life. It's not just about you living, doing your thing. It's about we are involved and engaged in a war that is fought in the spiritual realm in the unseen that we can't see. And this battle goes a long way before us. But it's one that we're in. One that, you know, again, Scripture tells us, Ephesians 6, that, that the battle is going on in the spiritual realm, in the heavenly realm, in the, in the unseen realm, that it's not against flesh and blood, but against the spirit, the powers that be, the principalities, the air. That's where the battle is. And what we're talking about, cosmic battle, is really the battle between a lie versus truth and illusion versus reality. And we're in this right now And this is part of something that we all face. Now, next fill in the blank was this, the fact that all of mankind, yes, we're in this cosmic battle, but we also have a cosmic enemy. A cosmic enemy who seeks his agenda is your personal destruction. He wants to see you go down. He wants to steer you to an eternity without God's presence, and that ultimately is hell. A place that, by the way, was never, ever created for mankind. That was always and only created for Satan and the fallen angels that fell with him. In fact, I'm thankful that we have First Peter that God tells us that in his heart, he isn't willing that any should perish, but all come to everlasting life. That's the heart of our Father. That's the heart of God. That he doesn't want anyone to perish. But nonetheless, the enemy's agenda is to take out as many as he can. Now, what does that mean for us here today who are in Christ? If you're in a relationship with Jesus Christ, understand something. You can't lose that salvation. That is something secured by God fully. Okay, that doesn't mean that we sin willfully. No, there's scripture that counter that. Romans 6, what should we do? Should we go on sinning that grace might increase? By all means, no. God doesn't say, hey, you've got to get out a hell card that you can play in your pocket and then go live in the world. No, 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 that doesn't happen that way. The Spirit of God, first of all, I don't know about you, anybody ever had a spanking from the Spirit of God? He's got a big hand, doesn't he? And Yeah, it's not a good thing. But truth is, we're in a battle, and you have an enemy, and we don't want to be ignorant of that. That's so important that we don't just kind of wander aimlessly in life, thinking, expecting everything to go rosy, knowing that we're in a war zone. <clears throat> Few acknowledge this, but a lot of people ignore this, and that's why I want to bring it to your attention today. Now, the truth is, what is the truth? The truth is that this cosmic enemy, he seeks to destroy your very soul. That is his agenda. He wants to take people out. He wants to take them down. John 10.10 tells us what the enemy is. The thief. The thief comes only to steal, Jesus says, and to kill and to destroy. And Jesus saying, I, I came that they may have life and have it more abundantly. See, God doesn't come to take life. He comes to give life. Give life not only now in the present in which we live, but also to give life eternally. And it's, and it's amazing and it's a blessing that he does. And the thief, the thief is Satan himself. He's the one who's the enemy of God and he's also the enemy of mankind. Why does he hate mankind? Last week we talked about it. In whose image is man made? In the image of God. So we remind the enemy of God the Father and therefore he links us in with that as well. All those who follow Satan in his ways, choosing not to follow God and not to follow his word, they're following the father of lies, which is also who the enemy is. John 8, 44, Jesus speaking, saying that those, he was talking to you, not those who weren't followers of God and his word, he says, you are of your father, the devil, and you want the desire to do the desires of your father, for he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. And whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and he is the father of lies. So not only is he our enemy who seeks to rob, kill, and destroy, but also is all about lies. And it's amazing 
how much he weaves all of that when he comes after mankind. This cosmic battle and the cosmic enemy is as old as time began. In fact, before time as we know it began. This is where this was. This is where this started. In fact, it goes all the way back previous, even further. But we see it an example in the Garden of Eden. And that's where our struggle really began. Last week we talked about the fact of the why we were created. We looked at the fact that all things to glory God, to give God glory. Creation, remember he said at the very end, the conclusion of chapter 2 of Genesis, he said what? He declared that all of creation was very good. That was his summation of everything that he had done. And he declared it wonderful and beautiful and good. And we were all created in that specific to give God glory, to, to, to elevate his name and to give him the praise that he deserves. Now, in this creation, however, and perfect paradise, mankind, in that scenario, trusted God fully. There was, there was such an incredible relationship back and forth between, between God as creator and man as creation and, and, and the very role that he placed us in the garden to tend and to care for and to, to oversee and have dominion, which all of that resulted in obedience to him. And all was going great. Until an outside influence sought to sway and, and to tempt and to trick God's created image bearers into moving from trusting God to trusting themselves. And that's where we're talking about today. This is where mankind and creation as a whole got derailed forever in the eyes. Why? Because the eyes went off of God and instead turned only upon themselves which is what sin ultimately really fully trusts in. When we cater to that, we are not trusting God in any way. We're trusting our own thoughts and our own evaluation in that moment. In fact, today's message is entitled, Timeline, Sin Trusts in Itself. Sin Trusts in Itself. Get your fill in the blank here. I'll give you the, the next one here for the big idea. The big idea of today's message is this is that sin happens. It happens when we ultimately, first fill in the blank, trust in ourselves. Trust in ourselves more than we trust in God. Again, sin happens when we ultimately trust in ourselves more than when we trust in God. I mean, have you find that to be true? Yes or no? I mean, we're definitely in the moment, we're not factoring God in that equation if we're finding that we're tempted and kind of being dragged away. I mean, we're not looking to him for answers and solution and guidance. No, we're seeing whatever it is in front of us. And that's what has our attention. And it's just us, us and it. Have you ever played the good idea, bad idea game? <laughs> ever done that? In your mind, in your head, where you vacillate between should I, should I not? Should I, should I not? Have you ever wrestled with that? I, I'm telling you, depending on what the temptation is, I've been there. Vacillating. Should I? Should I not? Should I? Should I? I know in my spirit it's like I don't want any part of that. But then the flesh, the flesh says, wait a second, hold the hold the door. Hold, hold, hold the phone. Absolutely. You know, giving room, if you will, in that moment for contemplation or even the possibility. And I, I will tell you this, and this is a truthful statement, that if you or I, if we give sin and temptation a millimeter, mater, that's not a mater, millimeter, thank you. That came out funny. A millimeter of space in your brain and your thoughts, if you just give just that little itty-bitty space and you do nothing with it, you're quickly heading to destruction. And what does destruction bring? What does that choice bring if you choose to go down that path? Well, I'll tell you what it yields. This is what it yields. It yields shame and blame and guilt and hurt and pain and trauma and drama and it's all for you to enjoy. Aren't those wonderful things to enjoy? That's, that's, that's like a party, right? Oh, man, bring it, right? No, it's miserable. It's terrible. In fact, none of that stuff is good. In fact, that, this is why God gave us 2 Corinthians 10.5. I've given it to you. You don't have to turn there. But listen to what it says. It says that we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take every thought captive. That is, we we grab that sucker by the throat, choke it out, and it says take it and make it obedient to Christ. I mean, if you can almost picture that in your mind, the kind of power we have is that whenever any temptation faces us, you can grab it by the throat 
and bring it and shove it down before the feet of Christ. You can say, I can take that thought captive and I can make it obedient. I don't have to sit and entertain it. And I'm grateful that God has given us that ability and that authority to be able to do so. If not, we would all be doomed, right? If all, we wouldn't have any hope if, if that was the case, if it wasn't there. And now, a truth is this, and you need to see this, next fill in the blank here, that only, only a captive thought is rendered powerless. Only a captive thought is rendered powerless. If you give it a millimeter, I'm telling you, that'll become a, a raging Cajun fire very, very quickly in your heart and mind. Now, see why? Because when thoughts, next fill in the blank, when thoughts are not taken captive, their result naturally becomes sin, which yields death. In other words, it doesn't take you anywhere good when you allow that sin to run. James 1, 14 to 16 gives us the, the sin cycle, really the understanding of how, how, how do we get in those moments? How do we even get to the place of even being tempted and allowing that decision to carry us the rest of the way? Well, this is what it says. It says, but each one, James says, verse 14, but each one is tempted when he's carried away and enticed by his own lust. Pause right there. The thinking in the mind is where it begins. It's that millimeter thought that we allow to kind of roll around in our noggin. Okay, we give some space and place to it. And this is what it says, that we're carried away by it and we're enticed by it because it's our own lust. It's what our flesh is, is crawling out for and, and wanting and desiring. And what happens? Well, once lust has conceived, it says it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Don't be deceived my beloved brethren. Now, it's interesting because if you read just a little bit before this, the, 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 the thoughts being thrown out that, that, well, listen, when I'm being tempted, God's tempted me. Like somehow God knows he should remove all the obstacles in my life and not allow anything to come into my path. It's the, basically an accusation is happening in just the verses just before. And it's saying when I'm tempted that God's tempted me. It says don't say that when you're being tempted, God's tempting you. For, for God, first of all, can't tempt he can't be tempted by, by anything evil, and nor does he tempt. He doesn't do that. No. What happens is we tempt ourselves. We start thinking about it. We start just letting it roll around. We don't grab it by the throat and bring it to the obedience of Christ. And next thing you know, you got this raging Cajun fire that starts ripping out and starts your whole, 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 whole mind and body is on fire. And then you wonder why you're in pain. The deception of sin is that we know or that we think we know more than God. That's part of the lie. That somehow, some way, we know better what we need. We know better than what God does in terms of this, this next course of action. Now, it isn't until the results of the action yield pain and suffering that was never on the radar before we said yes to continue. Have you ever noticed that? Have you ever done that? Have you ever thought about that? Those stupid moments of the stupid things we do. That, you know what, we, we, the, the pain that follows it, we never thought about it beforehand. Am I the only one in the room? Okay, everybody's keeping their hands. I ain't raising my hand. I ain't doing it. Okay, here's the thing. Someone wiser than me, here's your next uh, fill in the blank. Someone wiser than, me, wiser than me said that. It says sin makes you stupid. Sin makes you stupid. The more you cater to it, the more ignorant you're going to be, the more the fool you're going to play. And it's going to take you in places that aren't good. A prime example of such a statement coming to fruition is seen, and we can look at it within the garden and a choice that's made that was yielded, absolutely yielded, horrible consequences for all. So if you want to grab your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 1 through 16, but uh, actually 19, but we're going to look at right now verses 1 through 7. Genesis 3, verses 1 through 7, and, and I'm titling this point here for you, A Snake Walks Up to Some Bark. A Snake Walks Up to Some Bark. Take a look at this in verse 1 of chapter 3. It says, now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, indeed, has, has God said, you should not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, well, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, yeah, you shall not eat from it or touch it or, or you'll die. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. For God knows that in the day that you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and, and you'll be like God, knowing 
good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate. And she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Now, then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. Again, a snake walks up to some bark. It almost sounds like the makings of a joke, yeah? Kind of has that, that, that little tone to it. But I'll tell you what, this was no joking matter. Nothing about this moment was joke. Uh, it was a joke at all. For an undisclosed amount of time, we don't know how long Adam and Eve were there. We have no idea. They were outside of the realm of time like we are. Okay, but for whatever undisclosed amount of time, Adam and Lee, Eve lived in this garden, uh, okay, the Garden of Eden, tending to it, caring for it, caring for the animals, enjoying God in this incredible relationship with Him. Yet the enemy... Your next fill in the blank here. The enemy in serpent form came out to do something. He came out to destroy all that God had made. And mainly, he went after the connection between God and man. Now, we might be thinking to ourselves, well, why in the world would he do this? Well, we might never know or understand the full reason or full agenda, but I'd like to give you my sanctified imagination about it. Here's the thing. I think, honestly, because previously to this, Satan had already fell. He already fell from heaven. He had already, he'd already got the boot. He's no longer in God's presence. He's no longer one of the servants of the Most High. He's now been cast down to earth, him and one-third of the fallen angels with him, and, and he's down there and he's ticked off. Because the interesting piece is that the world down in which we live, that man at one time had dominion and rule. And he knew if he could go after it, if he could sever this connection in some way or screw things up, that bottom line, this rule would fall apart. And dominion would fall apart. And so we see this in the way that it starts to happen. Uh, notice the way that he went about it. He, he threw out these baited questions to the naive of evil. I mean, he just he, he threw out these little teasers. He, from the very beginning, he was manipulating the conversation. Have you ever been played like that? Have you ever had someone? I had someone do that to me, literally, true story. I had someone come to my house that I, that I own in Phoenix and and this guy came in. It was late at night, 8 o'clock. I get this knock on my door. He comes up to the door says, hey, yeah, I'm so-and-so. I'm out here late. Just uh, I've got some stuff that I'm, you know, working on. He says, you know, I've got uh, water softeners and things like this. And so he comes in, and, and in the midst of it, he, uh, he uh, says, hey, can I get a glass of ice water? So he says, okay. So I, 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 he sits down at my table. I give him uh, a glass of water with ice. And, and it's interesting because, you know what, no sooner, no sooner in the, por in the course of that did he immediately start the conversation about the ice. And in the course of the conversation, it had nothing to do. He didn't want the glass of water. In fact, the only reason he was there was to manipulate that conversation, to bring it to, hey, guess what? I got a solution for you for this ice that has impurities in it. And next thing you know, hook, line, sinker. I'm, I'm, I'm new to the house, new to owning the house, the whole deal. Next thing you know, you know, I'm being taken down the road. And, you know, I look back now going, hey, wait a second. He didn't want no glass of ice water, right? Similar situation here. They manipulated the conversation. That's what the enemy did. It, there was doubt that was casted on, on God's true character. And holding, like somehow, some way, God was holding back knowledge from Adam and Eve. And, and the thought of uh, contemplation to disobey. Do you understand that to this moment, up to this moment, there wasn't even a thought in Adam and Eve's head to do anything other than what God had asked. That this was where they were at in that perfect relationship. But now the enemy, the way that he posed the questions and the way that he did, kind of manipulated situations there. So how, how did he do it? Well, through doubt cast, you know, again, doubt casting upon God's character to diminish God's trustworthiness. And that somehow holding out on Adam and Eve's knowledge. You know, Satan himself sought to erode, uh, this is your next fill in the blank here. That Satan, he sought to erode the foundation by which they fully operated in. In other words, to trust in God. <clears throat> Trusting in God was where they were at. That's totally what they were involved with. That's how, how awesome the connection was. And instead, they wanted to replace this with trusting self, if you will, for knowledge and wisdom. Now, sadly, sadly, it didn't take them very long to topple, did it? I mean, this was a small, isolated conversation that ended up in a huge, huge situation. Notice that Eve, in some of the comments that she made, it says that she saw that the tree was good for food. Are you going to tell me 
that they haven't seen this tree before? Are you going to tell me they haven't walked by this tree a bazillion times? That she hasn't seen the fruit that's been on that tree? No, she's seen it the whole time, but it's, it's a different kind of look. She's looking at it now. She saw that the tree was good for food. That tree was never for food. That tree was, was not part of the food that God had granted for them to eat of. But she saw that it was good for food. Saw that it was a delight to the eyes. I don't know if it was shiny and sparkly or all blinged up. I have no idea. Who knows? But it drew her attention and, and, and was desirable to make one wise. Now notice this. That sounds just like that sin cycle, doesn't it? The thoughts that start and the way that they lead. Again, bing, bada, boom. She took, she ate, and she gave some to Adam. And then, bam, everything took place. Everything went down. Can, can you relate to that? Have you ever toppled so easy like that? Where things have just been in that way at that terribly bad moment, and you give in. Even Adam both to this point made no room in this for trusting God. They, they, they didn't even think in terms of factoring him in. There, there was a manipulated conversation, twisted trust from God to self, and ultimately leading to sin's destruction. And, and what we see is from the Garden of Eden to present. This is so true. The sin, sin has caused such great rebellion in mankind that desires to shirk off, if you will, the connection with God ultimately and his rule and his trust. Now, what they do, instead of trusting God, it's like placing man upon the throne, saying that man needs to sit where God sits and place that individual upon that throne of every man's heart and ultimately be their own God, little G-O-D, of their personal kingdom, trusting themselves above all else. Now, Proverbs 14, 12 is why we have this, and this is true, especially in this light. When you, when you trust your own thoughts and your own feelings and, and your own evaluation outside of the influence of God, Proverbs 14, 12 says, There is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of, of death. If you don't factor God in the equation and you just go about life and do your thing, and he's not part of the influence, his word, prayer, those, those moments of, of brothers and sisters, and if you don't have God's influence in those moments isolated, it's going to lead to, to, to a, not a good path. Eve thought that this fruit somehow was the right thing for her, the right thing to take, the right thing to eat. And how just previously that was not even a thought on the radar. And the truth is, is that thoughts are real and feelings are real. They are, and they can be very, very powerful in our lives. But something we have to keep in understanding is that even though thoughts are real and feelings are real, they're not always accurate and they're not always based in truth. And if we relied on those independent of any influence of God, I, I guarantee you it's just not going to be good. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna be opening yourself up to ways that, that aren't good. I mean, can we agree so, about something this morning? Can we agree that some of your thoughts or feelings, they actually could be off? Right? Can we agree to that? Maybe, maybe one or two. I don't know. Right? I mean, we can agree to that. Because it is. If we, if we place our own thoughts and feelings in that without God's influence, yeah, the accuracy is not going to be high. Thoughts absence of God or godly counsel can be deadly. Proverbs 11.14 says, where there is no guidance, the people fall. But in abundance of counselors, there is victory and safety. God has shared that with us so that we might understand he wants us to involve him. He wants us to trust those. Can you imagine, can you imagine how different it would go if before that you decided to walk willfully into sin and temptation and to disobey God, how different would it be if you stopped and talked to someone before you ever move forward Someone you trust, someone who you know is going to give you good godly counsel and insight and instruction and isn't going to agree with you crazy, okay, regarding your pending thought. Can you imagine how different the outcome would be? If someone really loved you enough and was godly and, I mean, loved Jesus and just said, listen, you're nuts. What are you thinking? Why do why, why you even want to even go there? It's not even worth it. And how that could help change the direction. I think it would drastically change I mean, what would have happened to Adam and Eve if they would have said to the snake, hold that thought, hey, God, why didn't they? Why didn't they? I, I don't know. But how different it would have gone. See, sin and disobedience to God never draws us closer. It never does to him. But instead, shame and fear, what it does is it pushes us away. Let's look, let's look at the next point today. The sounds of God's presence causes the game of hide and seek. Let's look at verses 8 uh, through 16 here. 
It says, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord uh, God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard your, the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he said to them, he said to him, he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, well, the woman you gave to me to be with me, she's the one who gave me the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, well, what is this you've done? And, and the woman said, well, it was the serpent. He's the one that deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you've done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you'll go, and the dust you'll eat all the days of your life. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put enmity, that is deep-seated hatred, between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. To the woman he said, I'll greatly multiply your pain in childbirth, and in pain you will bring forth children, yet your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Notice some things here. Verse 8 says, they heard the sound of the Lord. Okay, this is weird. Why, why would that freak them out? Why would it freak out Adam? Isn't that a normal occurrence? Didn't they normally hear the sound of the Lord? That was a very reassuring moment. That was an incredible relationship moment that when God would come, I mean, I could almost picture that they'd be so excited, elated, and be able to spend time with him. And, and that was like a normal occurrence. But yet, what does it say here? It says he heard and he was afraid. This normal part of their garden experience was truly absent at one time of fear and, and disconnection. It says they hid themselves for the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Think about it. They went and sheltered where there was a place of beauty and safety and comfortable. Now it's just opposite. Verse 9, God said, where are you? Calling out to the man. Okay. <laughs> Do you really think God had no idea where he was at? I, I can't see you. I mean, you think he's doing that? No. God knew exactly what tree. It's like, okay, number over there. Come over here. He, he would have known exactly where he was. Why did he do that? Why did God do that? Why did he call out to him in that way? Next fill in the blank here, this once perfect connection, this once perfect relationship. Now sin caused separation and alienation from God. See, I think God gave him a chance, gave him an awesome chance to turn and run to him. He knew what he did. He knew before he ever got there. He knew before he ever stepped into that garden. And yet he finds, where are you? They're hiding. Of course, verse 10 says, I heard you, and I was afraid, and so I hid. That's what Adam, can you imagine how hurtful that would be if one of your own children did that to you? I mean, if, if there was that much terror and fear that they ran and hid from you and, and, and were just didn't want to be in your presence. I can't only imagine this incredible, perfect relationship between God and man in this garden, in this way, beautiful, wonderful, and now all of a sudden things are jacked up. Once perfect unity and connection, now confusion and fear and isolation is hiding. Uh, he asks, God says, have you eaten from that which I commanded you not to? Now, again, next fill in the blank. God's desire in that moment, I believe, was accountability and was repentance, which ultimately repentance is to turn to God and to turn from sin. See, I really believe that God asked him that direct question because he really wanted him to come out from hiding and to come up to God and say, God, I'm so sorry that we did this. To take accountability for it. God is a God of second chances. He is, and I'm grateful for that. He's merciful in that way. He really, I believe, wanted that. And, of course, what happened? We get the blame game, right? <laughs> was it me? It was her, right? Starts pointing down the line. Goes to her. Was it me? Pointing to the snake. And just everybody's not taking accountability in any of this. God's question in that was not about manipulation or a trick, but it was a chance to come clean. And how different it would have been if remorse and humility and accountability would have been present in Adam in that moment. Instead, the blame game happened, and again, they all did. It wasn't me. And neither owned it, which again is another product of sin and ultimately trusting in self. Now, unfortunately, next fill in the blank, unfortunately, sin, that is trusting in self, Without God's influence, sin never makes things better, but always worse. 
Sin never makes things better, but instead makes things worse. Verses 14 to 16, interesting. Curses start to come out. God starts meeting them out. First thing he talks to is the serpent. It's interesting in this, we not only get the fact that, uh, would it freak you out if you saw a snake walking around? Seriously. I, I think I'd be a little worried about that. I, I kind of like seeing them slither. I do. I, I know how to get away from them, you know, or to take care of them if need be. But I can only, it'd be a weird thing to see a snake just trucking on, on legs. I don't know if he walks like the Geico lizard. I, I don't know if it's that. I, I don't know if he's going to be on all fours. I, who knows, right? Who knows? But interesting, in all of this, the curse goes to the serpent. And, and then there's a prophetic word that's given, verse 15. That is a foreshadow of what we're about to celebrate in two weeks. Take a look at what verse 15 says. It says, I'll put enmity between you. That's he's speaking to the serpent. He's talking the line of those of disobedience just like you. I'm going to put hatred between you and between the woman's offspring who from will come the Savior. Ultimately is what he was saying. And between your seed and her seed. Now he, he shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. That's a foreshadow of what took place at the cross. Ultimately, Satan thought he had won by, by having Jesus on the cross and his life being given. But when Jesus stepped out of the tomb three days later, and that stone rolled away, which we're going to be celebrating, that's the moment that Satan had his head crushed by God once and for all. That mankind would be redeemed. How interesting that in the midst of the sin, God already enacted the saving plan. And how cool is that? That God loves us that much. To the woman, he says, he's going to greatly increase your labor pain. You can thank Eve for that, ladies. Okay, seriously. Maybe it was a toothache before. I don't know. I've been in delivery. That's, that's some crazy stuff, and I, I'm thankful I'm a guy. Can I get an amen, guys? Yes? Yeah, yeah, I'm glad I'm a guy when I'm in that moment. You women are tough. I'm not going to lie. You're tough. I think guy, if guys had children, we'd only have one for bragging rights. I did it. I mean, her, her. I mean it's all it'd be. And it would be only one. Okay? Here's, that's the crazy part about it. But, but greatly increase the labor pain. Contention is going to exist in your relationship with your husband. There's things going to be whacked now in the relationship between you. That took place in all of this. Guzik, uh, one of my commentaries, he says some thoughts on this. He said, the woman, the woman's going to seek to dominate the man, a desire that works against God's ordained order for the home. See, that's not how God has structured the home. God has placed man over the wife to be the covering, to be, to be the protector, the authority, if you will. As God is, as, as, as Jesus is the head of the church, so, so man is the head of the home. And, and it's for, for the protection, the covering, the blessing that happens in all of this. And notice something, that that was established before the fall, not after the fall. That had already taken place the way that God ordained it. And so from that, because what was once perfect in that harmony and unity, where everything that was, was different wasn't contentious, but instead was in harmony and unity, now this relationship, there's going to be strains on it. In fact, God established Adam's headship, like I said, before the fall, and now it'll be much harder for a woman to submit to his headship, to, to, to say that you are the head of the home. Interesting, sin, what it's done, it's corrupted both sides. It's corrupted both the willing submission of the wife and the loving headship of the husband. So the rule of love founded in paradise instead is replaced by struggle and tyranny, and domination. And ladies, I tell you what, I have nothing against a strong woman at all. I tell you, I know, but I can tell you in, in the strength that so many times there's so many things that take place, and, and what it is, it all goes back to this moment and the struggles that we face and the struggles that we deal with. Sin and trusting in self never revealed the devastation that it caused or caused in that moment. It never does, no matter how fleeting that that momentary pleasure may bring. In fact, God has the man now to contend with. It's interesting, he's already talked to the serpent and the woman, and now he directs his attention to man. Look at this last point today. Wrong voice followed has global consequence. Wrong voice followed has global consequence. Look at verse 17 of chapter 3. It says, Then he said to Adam, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat from it, cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. 
both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Now the serpent and the woman both received curses directly, but do you notice that something did not happen directly to the man? The man was not given a direct curse and says, because, verse 17, you listened to the voice of your wife and ate. In other words, you, Adam, were only to listen to my voice. I'm the one that your attention should have been at. But because you chose to listen to your wife instead of me, trusting the voice of man over the voice of God, because of that action, you have cursed, the, because of you, your action has cursed <coughs> the whole earth. You listened to yourself. You trusted yourself, not listening to me. All creation was cursed because of Adam. The ground, the animals, what was joyful before is now going to be toil. Now it's going to be hard. Now it's going to come through sweat and pain, and, and life is going to be struggled through that. And it's going to be a constant state until you die and turn to the dust from which you came. The constant reminder. Your next fill in the blank here. Cosmic results in a very global consequence. Creation was cursed because of man sinning and trusting in self, not trusting in God, which ultimately then the sinful nature was passed on. Adam and Eve had kids, and so on and so on and so on. And guess what? Your parents gave it to you. If you're married, you have kids. You've now paid it forward. You've given it to your kids. And that's the very sinful nature that Jesus came to die for. That in the moment of our sinfulness in the garden, that Jesus enacted that, that God enacted the plan of Jesus to come. And that resurrection that we celebrate, that we can't wait to get to, is of that triumphant moment of God's provision in all of this. But ultimately, yes, it has global consequence. Creation's cursed in this way. And that sinful nature is what God died for. That sinful nature is what separates man from God. And, and that's ultimately the result in trusting in self without God and his instruction. And a true statement today for you, another fill in the blank, is that sin always starts as a false belief before a very disobedient action occurs ultimately what I'm thinking or feeling. So whenever we sin or trust in ourselves, it's because we're tempted ultimately either to doubt whether God stated something or to question if he really knows as well as we know ourselves and our situation, somehow thinking that God is clueless in the moment as to what we really think we need. I'm glad I'm not God. I tell you, I'd, I'd be so irritated with creation. Oh, my goodness. I would. I'd toast us all. I'd toast myself. That's what I would do. Seriously, I mean, it's nuts. How valuable, next fill in the blank, how valuable to not follow the wrong voice. How valuable to not follow the wrong voice, to follow Satan's temptings and our self-guidance again without having God in the influence of that. Only following the right voice of God and the living word are we then able, fill in the blank there, to stay in the vein of giving God glory with our whole being. Now we've just come full circle to the very thing we talked about last week as to why we're created, to give God glory. See, when we follow the right voice of God and we follow his word and live by it, we're able to stay in that vein. And that's where God ultimately wants us to be. So in closing, here's the closing statement. If a snake walks up on you, okay, don't engage in a conversation. Don't even go there. Don't even give a moment or a millimeter in your space, in your mind, or in your thoughts. Don't engage in that way. Destroy. And take. Don't allow it to roll. It's bad stuff. It'll take you down the wrong road. I love one of my favorite scriptures. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. But in all your ways acknowledge him. And he will make your path straight. If you lean not what you think and understand and feel, but you say, God, I want you in the equation in this decision. Give me the guidance I need. He says, I will gladly give it to you and make your path straight. Do you guys hate the switchbacks of life that we choose to go on? You know what? I like a straight journey, just A to B. Let's get there. 
Trust God fully above self. James 4, 8 says, come close to God and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Ultimately, there's no better place to be but close to God. Amen? God wants us to be close to him. He wants you to know him. He is a knowable God. He has revealed himself through his word, through <laughs> creation, through one another. God has revealed his, himself through Christ. He wants us to be close to him, to grow in the grace and knowledge of God into maturity, lacking nothing in him. So may I exhort you all, trust in God, not in yourself. Amen? Amen. Let's pray and let's prepare our heart today for communion. Father, we love you and thank you and are grateful for today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this opportunity, God, to look to you, to draw our hope and our strength and our peace from you. And God, to, to be real, uh, just be revealed, and God, in this moment of, of how important it is to listen to your voice. Father God, I pray that you would help us to look to you and you alone, not to look to ourselves and our own understanding or feeling. God, not to give way in any way, shape, or form to having the enemy have a place or their thoughts in our mind. Help us, Father, I pray, to, God, just to, 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 to be close to you in all ways. And God, through it, may we experience the life you've created. Help us, God, we pray. Not to trust in ourselves, but to trust in you. Father, as we prepare for the time of the table of communion, of just the remembrance that you've said that we, it's so important that we do as your people, God, thank you that you are so trustworthy, so faithful. God, thank you that you and you alone have paved the way that we might have life with you. God, as you were in that upper room and giving the example through the bread and the cup, God, representative of your blood, saying not only your body being broken, but the blood being shed for us. God, thank you for all of it. May we never forget how precious it is. We give you praise and glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The men would come forward. We'll go ahead and pass this out. Let's go in peace.
Scripture tells us that in the night in which the, the Lord Jesus was to be betrayed, it says he took the bread, he offered thanks, and he broke it and said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us eat. Scripture also says that in the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us drink. And to that we say, God is good. Amen? Let's pray. and We'll have a closing prayer and we'll be dismissed. Father, we love you and thank you and are grateful for today. God, we thank you for this opportunity to gather in your name. We thank you for your word that it's life-giving, not life-taking. I pray that you'd help us, each one of us, God, to trust not in ourselves, but to trust fully in you. Help us, God, in those moments of sin and temptation that, God, that we might, instead of entertaining or thinking or even giving a millimeter of room, that we take every thought captive obedient to you. Help us, God, to follow your voice. Train us that we might hear. We love you and thank you. It's in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Hallelujah. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Rest of your week.